Rene, good good afternoon. It's Jan. Did I use the right one to come in? Did I use the one that's supposed to be just for us? Yes. Okay, good, thanks. Welcome everyone, it's four o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Renee, could you do the roll call, please? Yes, um, your name, please state present. Representing Adams County on the Board of Health, Julie Molica. Rosanna Reyes. Rosanna Reyes. Maybe she stepped away from her keyboard. Um, Julie Schultz. Present. Representing Arapahoe County on the Board of Health, Jan Brainerd. Present. Dr. Thomas Faywell. Present. And Dr. Kaya Gallagher. Present. Tri-County Health Department leadership. Adam Anderson, Interim Director of Planning and Information Management. Present. Michelle Askenazi, Director of Emergency Preparedness, Response, and Communicable Disease Surveillance. Present. Heather Baumgartner, Director of Community Health Promotion. Present. Lisa Bolstad, Administrative Assistant. Present. Jill Bonchinski, Director of Nutrition. Present. Amrani Brockman, Executive Assistant. Monique Didier, Director of Administration and Finance. Present. Dr. John Douglas, Executive Director. Uh, present. Maine Perman, Director of Human Resources. Present. Penny Grandy, Director of Nursing. Present. Brian Halavasek, Director of Environmental Health. Present. And Jennifer Ludwig, Deputy Director. Present. Roll call is now complete. Thank you. Um, I believe Julie is calling in from New York. Hopefully she'll be joining us shortly. And um, Rosanna, you're with us now. Great. And Kaya, that um, I am, I am here. Great. Good. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, did the Tri-County team have anyone they would like to introduce for our meeting tonight? Oh, Michelle Askenazi. Thanks. Hi, Jan. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce Jennifer Chase. She's our COVID-19 communicable, uh, sorry. She is our COVID-19 um, epidemiology manager. And uh, she is on today with us uh, for uh, helping support the presentation with Dr. Douglas, along with Alex Kellogg, our COVID-19 partnerships and strategies manager. Welcome, Jennifer. Uh, Kai, I, I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Ann Rail. Uh, she's acting as a, a consultant right now uh, for Tri County Health Department, um, potentially transition manager, and potentially a receiver. 
Welcome, Bill-Ann. Anybody else not seeing any other hands raised? Um, we'll move on to the first action item then, which is, um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from April 14th? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? No, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Um, we'll move on now to the information items, um, the first of which is the legislative update. Many thanks to the Tri-County team for compiling this very detailed report on the public health legislation that was considered by the Colorado General Assembly during the past session, which, as I understand it, ended just a few days or hours ago. Oh, Dr. Douglas, did you want to um, give us some highlights from the report? Yeah, I, I want to thank Melissa, who's not with us, uh, and who actually has another job now, but who's continued to support us in her spare time for helping us uh, wind up the session, helping us track on things. Um, you know, I guess I'll begin by quoting Jennifer Miles, the lobbyist that works with CALFA, who we've been working on on many of these bills, uh, to summarize the last week, which is Jennifer's uh, uh, statement was not much good happens in the final days of the session. Um, and I think that's probably not completely true <laughs> because some good bills got passed, but it was pretty chaotic. And um, there were some things that uh, didn't go as well as we'd hoped, even though I would have to say, as I step back and look at the landscape of the 600 odd bills that got introduced, what got passed, what got compromised on, what sausage got made, I think it was a pretty good session for public health. Um, I'll, I'll mention by way of summary that there were seven bills in which we were um, engaged, I guess six bills actually. Uh, the biggest disappointment was that the flavored tobacco bill uh, that we began the session by talking to the Board of Health about, which had a lot of energy and frankly, we had a lot of uh, engagement, particularly Mara Prozer who testified before the legislature. It ended up at the last minute, as far as we can tell, because the leadership decided that the, the risk of a veto by the governor was too much and uh, they sort of moved it along in a way that it didn't get passed. Um, I was, however, quite pleased that a bill, uh, the bill on toxic air contaminants passed. And while that was the one air quality bill that Tri-County was directly involved with, uh, the Post had an article today about other air quality bills that passed, and it was a pretty broad grouping. CDPHE got a, 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 an unprecedentedly large budget supplement, 47 million, to do air quality work for the department, which is undoubtedly going to impact work in the metro area, including our counties. There was another bill that would um, of over $100 million to enhance energy efficiency, particularly through e vehicles. And again, while we weren't particularly engaged in that, that's going to also be uh, something we think makes a very big difference. Uh, we were pleased that a bill on health benefits for Colorado children and pregnant persons passed. Um, I'd say that, and, and we were also pleased that a bill on oversight of chemicals used in oil and gas drilling passed. This is not going to change anything overnight, but it's going to create greater public transparency around an area that uh, transparency has been somewhat limited. Um, there were two bills that um, I, th I think I feel somewhat mixed about, the Fentanyl Accountability and Prevention Bill that was driven by the extraordinary surge in fentanyl cases, overdoses, and deaths. Um, I think we'll do many good things for trying to uh, address the fentanyl epidemic. I think most of you are probably aware it got to be controversial really almost as soon as it was introduced because it contained provisions to felonize the possession of fentanyl. And there ended up being a very protracted, animated discussion between folks that uh, had expertise in public health and addiction services and our colleagues in law enforcement, where there was a really just a radically different view about whether felonizing possession of fentanyl would be a good thing or not. Ultimately, the legislature ended up deciding to include that. The other one that there was a little bit of mixture about was also a substance although not a substance that's as explicitly harmful as fentanyl, and that's Kratom. And we didn't look to get involved in that, but because Bernadette Albanese had really developed an expertise in this, really growing out of some work uh, 
educating the Castle Rock City Council a couple of years ago about it, we got consulted. Um, we're still not what ended up in the conference committee between the Senate and how House version actually contains. Um, I think Crytum will be regulated in some way, shape, or form. I think there will be more research into what harms are actually resulting from that. And then I, I want to just acknowledge that um, our uh, request for JBC support for two items, an EMOM survey and SNAPI outreach funding uh, also were supported. So uh, a, a crazy session. I think we'll be learning um, as we go, as the dust settles, you know, which things that look pretty good now actually turn out not to be so good, <laughs> which things that don't look so good look better. And then, of course, the governor does have the opportunity to exercise his veto pen. So we'll have to see whether any of the bills actually uh, are, are subjected to that. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Um, I guess, uh, is, it, uh, is, is it likely that there'll be a renewed effort to uh, try to pass the legislation regarding flavored tobacco and synthetic nicotine in the next session? Or is, is that being too hopeful? Well, I don't know. You know, the, the sponsors of the bill have have said pretty vociferously that they want to bring it back. And Representative Mullica, I guess Julie is still not here and can't give us any inside baseball, certainly talked as though he didn't see this as being over and done with. Um, um, I, You know, the governor feels really strongly that this ought to be a local matter. And I think as long as the leadership in the legislature wants to try to avoid bills that are going to get vetoed, it's a little hard to know how that's going to progress. Um, I think many, but not all the business issues got worked out. I think most of the issues about whether consenting adults ought to be able to choose flavored products, that was a big issue, got worked out. But I think the local versus state issue remains uh, sort of a sticking point. Great. Thank you. Not seeing any other questions or comments um you know I, I guess one more bill i did want to mention i don't remember the name of it but it's a bill that provided this year for members of boards the same sort of protection that public health workers got last year which is they can remove personal information to avoid being doxxed uh that bill did pass and was signed by the governor and i think dr phil you testified for that one if i recall correctly um so we, we're pleased that some of the issues that have come up for board members uh, could be addressed by that bill this year. I'm sure we all appreciate that effort. So thank you. Thank you. I, I will warn you that the hassle of getting your name off stuff is worse than it looks when the bill passes. It's sort of a multi-step process. Please, it's a step forward. Uh, great. So um, we'll move on now to the COVID update. Great, that's me as well. And uh, Lisa, if you'll help me out as you always do. Um, I really appreciate Jen Chase joining me uh, because her program's been doing some really nice re-engineering and I thought it'd be nice for the board to hear it directly from her. Um, uh, next slide, please, um, Lisa. So we'll talk briefly about trends, what's happening in the world of vaccines, some hot off the presses modeling data. Uh, Jen will uh, give you an overview of what we've done to change our COVID response structure, and then I'll make a few closing remarks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so you may not be reading about COVID these days because there's so many other things to read about and because COVID has been somewhat out of the news, but the trends have until maybe the last two to three weeks just really been quite good. In the last two to three weeks, we have in fact begun to see an uptick in cases. On the left, cases in our three counties, um, Douglas Red, uh, Adams Blue, Arapahoe Orange. Arapahoe has had the biggest uptick in cases at this point. And the very, very same shape of a curve is happening at the state. Um, next slide, please. When you look at the state, looking at different levels of transmission on the left, you'll see that what a month and a half ago was a solid green map with a couple of dots of blue is now getting more multicoloredness in it. 
But one thing I want all of us to realize is that our ability to appraise and follow trends by following cases has become more and more limited as the frankly helpful improvement of having rapid tests that can be used at home are comprising a bigger and bigger part of what's actually being used when people test positive. We've, we've never measured every positive case, we've known that, but we now think we only may be measuring a third as many as we might have been measuring in December and January when Omicron hit and we couldn't find any rapid test at all. And the only way you could really get tested was a PCR test. And I'm mentioning that because on the right-hand graph of the slide, the average positivity by week by county is probably going to emerge as a more useful marker of what's really happening. Now, cases are going up, but we can't compare the magnitude in April and May to what we had in December and January, just because we're not having as much testing reported. But I do think that percent positivity business is going to be a more reliable indicator of what's actually happening severity-wise. And if you look at Adams County, for example, blue in terms of case rates, yellow in terms of percent positivity, or Douglas, yellow in terms of case rate, orange in terms of, of percent positivity, you'll see that the colors shift to a higher level with the percent positivity part of the equation. So I think we'll be following that um, as we, uh, uh, not ignoring cases, but realizing that they're gonna provide a more limited perspective. Next slide, please. Now, I think you're all aware that what's going on is, we always said, oh, maybe there'll be new variants. And yes, there've been new variants and new variants are you know, popping up now at the rate of about, about one every two months. So the original Omicron, um, as shown in turquoise on the left graph here, was uh, uh, known as BA1. That has been replaced over the last two months by uh, a second cousin or first cousin to Omicron, BA2. That's shown in yellow on the left-hand part of the graph. And then just over the last three weeks, we've begun to see something that's, we thought the Greek letters were going to make our life easier. Well, it turns out we got complicated Greek letters now because the new strain is Omicron BA2.12.1. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it turns out that this is the strain that's now moving very rapidly. CDC estimates in the upper uh, right part of the, the graph that this is last week, actually, BA 2.12.1 is now about 37% of cases uh, nationwide. That's actually up to 43% this week. The lower right looks at data and pie charts by region. We're region eight. Uh, BA 2.12.1 uh, was estimated last week to be about 25%. It's up to 36% in Region A. So it's beginning to take over from uh, BA uh, 2. And because it appears to be more transmissible than BA 2, and because it may be more immune evasive, meaning it may not respond as well to prior infections and it may not respond as well to vaccines, there is some concern, uh, that's the basis for the modeling data I'll show you, that we may be seeing more severe uh, cases in the next uh, uh, four to six weeks or so. Uh, next slide, please. Um, looking at the more severe part of the equation, these are hospitalizations. And you know, at this point, the, the hospitalization story, I think overall remains incredibly favorable. The red arrow on the left-hand part of the graph the left-hand part of the graph, and once again, being tri-county cases versus the right-hand part being state of Colorado cases, shows you the level at which CDC considers there to be high levels of community transmission based on hospital admissions. So you can see that even though we've had a little bit of an uptick in our counties in terms of hospitalizations lately, we are substantially below the threshold that CDC would use to not mandate masks, but to recommend uh, universal mask wearing in public indoor spaces. So uh, our curves look pretty similar to the Colorado curves. Sort of keep a mental uh, image of that in mind when I show you the modeling data because the modeling shows that we may be getting worse than that soon. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit of a segue, <clears throat> but it's an interesting segue because there's been a raging discussion, at least among the cognoscenti about COVID measurement, about whether all the people admitted to the hospital 
with a positive COVID test are actually sick with COVID, whether they are in the hospital due to COVID or whether they are in the hospital with an, an incidental COVID diagnosis because they're really there for another reason. Uh, the left-hand part of the, uh, this slide goes through a methodology that I think CDPHE is one of the leaders in the country of developing to try to use medical record review, um, now relying very heavily on electronic data through admission diagnoses and billing diagnoses to try to determine whether or not a hospitalization is very likely to be due to COVID or it's likely to be incidental and the person's not really being uh, hospitalized with COVID. And basically the gold standard ends up being that if you've got one uh, of two critical COVID related diagnoses as one of your top two billing diagnoses. I see Dr. Faywell wrinkling his brow because he knows what billing diagnoses are. Um, and um, you know, this is by the time you get out of the hospital and the hospital decided to charge you, you know, what their best appraisal of what you might actually be sick with. Go to the right and you can look in the red as what we think is the measure of what was really happening in terms of people getting sick due to COVID. So way back in May of 2020, not everybody in the hospital with a positive test was there due to COVID, but it was about 85, 87%. And move to the right, you can now see that we're down lower. 65.3% is what Dr. Hurley, he measured in this analysis. So maybe a third of folks in the hospital either have something else and they just happen to have COVID, or there's a gray area that is it might be presumptively with COVID or presumptively due to COVID. But that red group, again, about two thirds is what we think is actually happening right now. So I think this is a, a useful way of, of understanding what's been happening in terms of hospitalizations. And I appreciate the state putting in what was really a huge amount of work to try to develop this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, back one, please, Lisa. Yeah, there we go. So these are data Dr. Hurley he's been sharing with us, looking in the maroon as to what's happening in Colorado in terms of cases on the left and hospitalizations on the right since the BA2 wave began to kick off. And what she's done is, is these are not, the, the, the X axis is not dates. The x-axis is number of days since BA2 began to emerge in a given jurisdiction. And, and she's conveniently chosen a bunch of cities or states rather in the Northeast. On the left, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, New York City, and New Jersey. And on the right, most of the same ones, but also Connecticut, Massachusetts. Uh, the right one being hospital admissions, again, and compared to cases on the left. And I think what you can see is that we are sort of moving in tandem we're lower, and this is a really important thing to emphasize, we began to experience BA2 at a lower wave of a rate of cases and hospitalizations than most of these Northeast states did. And while our trajectory, the slope of the line has been pretty similar, we haven't gotten up as high, even though we seem to be moving in the same direction. And we might expect, if you look at these other states, that our trajectory of upwardness is gonna continue for at least another two weeks or so. Stuck up there in the upper right is the CDC's map of levels of community transmission, which is based on hospital uh, admissions, that rate per 100,000 that I showed you a few minutes ago with the red arrow. And what you'll clearly see is while Colorado, green is good, Colorado is considered to have a low level of community transmission right now because our hospitalization rates haven't gone up enough. Those states that Dr. Hurley has pulled out in the Northeast uh, are pretty much all yellow, which is intermediate or orange. So don't know when we'll get there, but I think there's a pretty good chance that we'll get to those levels at which higher levels of carefulness about mask wearing are likely to be recommended. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, there we go. So um, vaccines, these are, these are uh, data sort of giving you guys an update on uh, periodically. The main thing I wanna emphasize about our vaccination rates is that Adam's team has modified this. We're now showing you about vaccination, overall rates, completed rates, 
in booster rates among those who are eligible for everybody five and older. We had been showing you data at 12 and older. And for example, the rate of overall vaccination was in the low 80s. But because we've now we've added another group uh, down to five years old, it looks a little lower. We think this is probably a better way of telling the story. But just if you're used to seeing things being in the 80s, uh, we're, we're slipping a little below that. Um, individuals vaccinated by age group uh, continue to be a very striking age gradient. Older folks have got higher levels of both completed vaccination as well as boosted. Um, we continue to be enthusiastic about getting our 12 to 17 and 5 to 11 year olds vaccinated. Alex's team is working hard with our schools before they're out for the summer to try to promote the vaccination message. Even though this is clearly something that uh, not every family has decided to take advantage of. Uh, lower right corner looks at our rates of vaccination among various racial eth ethnic groups. And no surprise, we continue to see lagging rates in, among Hispanic uh, uh, persons. One thing I would note, uh, note, when you look at the percent with completed vaccination in all three counties, Adams 42% for Hispanic persons, Arapa 41 and Douglas 31, the rate of boosters appears to be higher. And the reason is that we're only considering people as, as having completed boosters if they've already been vaccinated. It's pretty interesting that if you've chosen to be vaccinated among our Hispanic residents uh, and get your first two doses, your rate of getting that uh, uh, booster dose is actually higher, 48 versus 42, for example, in Adams County, than it would be if you hadn't been vaccinated at all. Um, next slide, please. So Alex's team, um, as we've talked about in the last couple of Board of Health meetings, has really been redefining their equity focus. And she's got a lot of stuff crammed into this one slide in small font. Apologies for the small reading. Um, we've really continued to provide uh, accurate information and, and frankly, space for conversations around vaccine hesitancy. We've been doing some more innovative work in communities, working in events likely to have high attendance of unvaccinated communities to hand out rapid tests, people like those, masks, people actually still like those, as well as vaccine education information. Attending panels and facilitated conversations with specific groups to discuss vaccine hesitancy and benefits. And one example being the Somali youth basketball team in, in partnership with the Rocky Mountain Wealth Welcome Center. We are continuing to build partnerships with community-based organizations. We're working with under-vaccinated communities for clinics, education, and, and again, distribution of rapid at-home antigen tests and, and masks. I, I think these, you know, we've been giving out coffee coupons and cash and things like that to try to incentivize vaccination. I think it's quite smart that we're actually using things linked to the possibility of getting sick. There's a lot of value placed on having access to both the test kits and the mask, and we're hoping that can translate into more interest on uh, vaccination. Um, we are in a transition period in terms of accessibility of vaccination sites. So the state has now closed down all of its mass vaccination sites. Um, and those sites in the uh, first part of the year, as you can see, vaccinated a pretty high number of folks, almost 20,000 folks vaccinated in those clinics that are now closed, only 5,000 in the remaining community-based clinics. Um, this was done because the utilization of these clinics had dropped off so much that they weren't really being efficiently utilized. Um, we um, are continuing to work with CDC to try to provide us community vaccination clinics. But as, as things have cut back, we are concerned that there may be some at-risk communities that will be less well-served, particularly concerned about the number of weekend clinics uh, uh, being pulled back. Steps we've taken to try to mitigate this include the reallocation of our vaccine champion. This is a group of folks from the communities who are working with us to promote vaccinations, to focus on outreach and promotion of vaccine events, as well, in, as, well as pursuing collaboration with established providers in the community. For example, we recently met with Stride, the uh, uh, federally qualified health center to promote, um, cross promote community vaccine events, um, as well as establishing what we're calling series clinics that are gonna happen on a monthly basis through the summer to promote 
ease of, of knowing where to find community vaccination clinics after these fixed sites have been closed. I also wanna highlight a couple of things about testing. We are in reasonably good shape for testing right now. We have capacity to test across our <clears throat> communities about 12 to 15,000 persons a day. Um, as a reminder, during the worst time of the winter, we were testing upwards of 20,000 people a day. So we're not that good if we got that bad again. <clears throat> but we think we have enough capacity to handle an estimated peak in June. We just learned today that the state who has been closing testing sites, just like vaccination sites, because of underutilization and cost inefficiency, has decided not to close another 40 sites statewide in May and June. They've decided to leave those sites open through the end of June, for which we are really appreciative. Um, we are particularly appreciative that a very popular location in one of our equity neighborhoods, Del Mar Park, is going to be retained. It's got a tremendous flexibility to adjust to larger volumes if, if necessary. And I want to really thank Chris Houck, who's been our testing coordinator, for advocating for keeping that site open. We thought it was a, a, a hopeless task, but uh, Chris was very persuasive. And then finally, we continue to have interest in at-home test distribution as HRSA funding for uninsured individuals to access individuals has gone away. This happened at the beginning of April. And although we and others have been advocating for its being restored, this does not appear likely to happen. And this is gonna create an equity pinch for uh, lower income or uninsured folks that are, that are uh, seeking testing that we think uh, is gonna be potentially a challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, I wanna know what, or rather I wanna acknowledge what I think everybody has probably heard of this week, which is that at least sometime this week, some estimate it may be by Friday, we're gonna reach the previously unimagined grim milestone of a million deaths due to COVID across the country. Um, um, it, we, it's estimated again that we'll reach this toward the end of the week. President Biden's already had a ceremony acknowledging this. I think it's important to keep in mind that back when COVID started, some of the best estimations coming out of the White House was that the pandemic might claim 100 to a quarter of 100,000 to a, a quarter of a million lives. We obviously far exceeded that. I think it's also worth noting, this is a, a, a study from the Commonwealth Foundation a couple months ago, that vaccines as they were used through the end of December 21 were estimated to have saved as many more folks from dying as we had had died in, in total. In other words, 1.1 million. I also think it's useful, the piece on the right from Forbes magazine, or this is from, uh, I guess, NBC News, sort of outlines for us, how does this compare to other really, really big death events? Uh, seasonal flu kills about an estimated 360 people every 10 years. COVID is a million in two years. Uh, World War One and Two was less than a million combined. All the wars together taken together are about 1.2 million. HIV is far less than what's happened with COVID. So as we sort of, I think we've all probably gotten numb to these statistics. Uh, and one of the reasons for sort of at least pausing and reflecting this grim milestone and, and frankly, trying to honor the people who we've lost by uh, doubling down to do even better as we go forward. Next slide, please. Um, I want to close out with just a couple of remarks about the road to endemic, including modeling. We do have projections that we're going to be having a busier summer. CDC uh, 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 just a couple of weeks ago, again, reiterated the importance of wearing masks on airplanes and public transportation, despite the court decision that these could no longer be required. Um, next slide, please. Um, back one, Lisa. Yeah. So just a couple of slides from the modeling team that came out yesterday. And they're, they're now trying to include not only models uh, making assumptions about BA2, but also BA2.1, 2.1. They currently estimate that about one in every 108 to 149, that's a pretty broad window, uh, of folks in Colorado are currently infectious with COVID. Um, you can see that that prevalence got as high back in January as over 3% or so. So we're now down to about 0.3, 0.4%, uh, but we do appear to be going back up. Um, important caveat circled in red at the, at the bottom, the range of estimates 
uh, do represent a fair amount of uncertainty about the characteristics of BA 2.1, 2.1. Uh, next slide, please. And this is probably the meat of the modeling data. The team uh, took what we know about uh, BA 1, 2, and, and 2.1, 2.1 in terms of infectiousness. I think it's pretty interesting that BA1 was over twice as infectious as Delta, and BA2 was one and a half times more infectious than BA1. And BA2.1, 2.1 is yet more infectious than BA2. When you run those numbers together, uh, as, as summarized in the little blue box at the bottom, BA2.1, 2.1 is over four times more infectious than Delta. And, and again, this is what one expects with viral evolution. If, 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 a, if a viral variant is gonna persist, it's gonna persist either because it escapes immunity or because it's more infectious. We think we're seeing the uh, latter with BA2.1, uh, 2 2.1. We don't yet know whether or not it's gonna be uh, evasive of the immune system. And that's really what the model on the right looks at. This is number of hospital admissions looking back to that really steep landmark in early 2022, the blue is our uh, estimations if you have low immune escape, that is the vaccine or prior infection is gonna cover you pretty well. The orange is if it's a high immune escape, meaning prior immunity, prior infection don't help you so much. Uh, two points to be made here. Toward the end of June, we are going to be facing more challenge than we've really experienced since the middle of February in terms of hospitalizations. And to the extent that that also translates into sick hospital employees, we could be getting into hospital shortage times. Although very, very, very important to note, nowhere near as bad as what we experienced in January and February. So the roller coaster can continue. The height of the roller coaster is gonna depend on how much immune escape uh, the current strain uh, 2.1, 2.1 actually uh, 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 produces. Next slide, please. And to get back to the testing comment, this is the estimated testing capacity that's gonna be required in Colorado based on that current modeling data. Now, remember I told you that Chris's estimate was that we've got the capacity in our counties to provide about 12 to 15,000 tests a day. Statewide, the estimate is the worst we might get in June with a surge is around 50,000 tests a day. We've been overall doing about 25% of the testing in our three counties for the state. So while this sort of surge in testing demand, and again, this is with rapid test at home, that surge in testing demand makes me somewhat nervous. It does look like that with those test sites remaining open, we're probably gonna do okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, this was an interesting piece that I just wanted to share with you because it's sort of like, uh, maybe we begin to understand something about viral evolution and maybe we can begin to get an idea about what we might expect. Um, this is data from South Africa where there are two new variants that have been detected, BA4 and BA5. Oh my God, more alphabet soup. Uh, we actually had our first identification of uh, one of these two variants. Uh, uh, it's not a patient who lives in one of our counties, but the individual does work in one of our counties. So we are potentially going to be experiencing, as South Africa is currently experiencing in these two graphs, um, these two new variants. What I really wanted to point out, though, was the pathogen progression evolutionary tree on the right, where you look at these various variants we've experienced. You go back to the origin virus in China. Uh, the first variant we experienced was Delta, or sorry, was Alpha, followed by Beta, followed by uh, a little bit of Gamma and then Delta. And as you can see, what's happened really since Omicron came out is that these um, strains have tended to be evolutionarily more and more related to each other. And so while Omicron came from a very different part of the viral evolutionary tree than did Delta, it looks like that for the last six months, we've stayed on a relatively more constant course of seeing variations of Omicron, BA1, BA2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, interestingly, uh, initial data out of South Africa suggests that the vaccine protects better against BA4 and BA5 than does prior infection with either BA1 or 2. 
that becomes uh, as part of this ongoing discussion about whether or not if I get infected, do I need to worry about getting a vaccine? The vaccines with this new lineage of variants does appear to hold some preferential protection over and above simply getting uh, infected. Um, next slide, please. Um, sort of the, the big looking ahead, and I, I, again, I've outlined and read the stuff that I really want us to like be aware of and big focused on. It's attention to new variants. It's enhancing access to highly effective treatments. Uh, just got an update from the State Health Department today. We have plentiful supply of treatment right now. Plentiful supply of Paxlovid, the oral treatment, and plentiful supply of the monoclonal antibodies. One of the big challenges now is to get the public to understand these treatments are available and to get docs to understand there's plenty of supply, you can go ahead and prescribe it. We want to be vigilant about surge capacity and its implications for testing and treatment. Um, Jen's going to talk to you in just a second about our transition planning and how it uh, we think is helping us move to an endemic. And then finally, we're going to continue to learn lessons of COVID. Uh, I've, I've put in here the is this issue of trying to honor our losses and, and do a better job in the future, as well as preparing for uh, future waves. So I'm going to Lisa, I'll let you advance to the next slide and pass the baton to Jen. Hey, thank you, Dr. Douglas. I'm happy to be here with everyone today and excited to um, talk a little bit about our transitions in the COVID-19 EPI program. Um, this is a, a direct result of the directives that came out uh, February 28th from the CDC requesting that local public health agencies um, stop doing individual case investigation and contact tracing and move to a more population-based prioritized model of case interview um, that really focused um, more on um, outbreak investigations, uh, priority populations, and uh, treatment options, as well as uh, more uh, population-based information sharing with the public as opposed to individual level interventions. So, um, so we've been working um, over the last two months to implement a new uh, program structure um, that really focuses more on, on population level um, and priority populations. And um, I will show you that in the next slide. We have just been in the um, this uh, structure for the last 10 days. Uh, we implemented the new structure on May 2nd and a big thanks to um, Aaron Phillips on um, Adam's team on the on the PIM um, program for helping us um, move this forward very quickly with a, a lean improvement process um, that we went through in April. So, uh, so this is the, um, the new program structure. And um, this is um, at the top is the, our division director, Michelle, and um, the COVID EPI program all the way to the right alongside um, my colleague, Alex, um, with the partnerships and strategies program. And then all of the other wonderful programs from the EPR CDS division um, are, are demonstrated in the gray box. So, but under, uh, to focus again back on the far right box for the EPI program, um, we're still supported, of course, by our medical epidemiologist and also um, our school and partner liaison that focuses a lot working with our external partners more around policy um, than epidemiology. And we also have a more administrative support for the team. Um, we have a HR support with JC, um, and our quality improvement team, which is uh, three folks that used to focus um, solely on a, with our investigation task force, have expanded their reach to support all of the teams under the COVID-19 EPI program. So some of, the, some of the teams are the same, although everyone has um, made some updates and revisions to the programs. So previously, um, Prior to May 2nd, our teams consisted of the investigation task force that does case investigation and contact tracing, um, three outbreak teams um, that were defined by outbreak settings, schools, community, and um, healthcare settings, and then a community resources team. 
so the new teams um, that have come out of this restructure are the investigation investigation task force. That's the ITF. And on that team, um, it has been reduced in size since we're no longer focusing on uh, universal case investigation and contact tracing. Um, but we're still um, performing interviews for cases. And so I'll go over that um, in just a bit to um, show you how we're still supporting cases um, with uh, resources. So on that team, we have uh, investigators and um, um, each of those teams has a lead because there are, there are three, three teams that have a lead and a coordinator and then report to the supervisors. So um, we have about uh, still 25 people on that team. Um, and then to the right of the ITF is uh, we're very excited to um, start uh, an initiative with uh, Grace, who is the health equity initiatives manager at Tri-County. And she is leading a team of two dedicated full-time health equity advocates in the EPI program. And um, this week, we're also recruiting liaisons from each of the teams to sit with Grace and ensure that health equity is implemented across the teams in the program. Um, our outbreak teams have all been combined into one um, and um, reduced in size as well. So th this group will follow up on outbreaks in all settings. And very, very exciting, probably the most exciting news to share is the treatment team we have. Um, and this team is coordinating and managing referrals to treatment for cases that are interested in treatment, one of the new um, referrals that we're doing in the case investigation. And so far we've had um, just over these past 10 days, 114 uh, referrals to the treatment team, um, coordinating treatment and um, access to referrals. So very exciting, a really great response and um, a lot of satisfaction on the client side with uh, the work that we are doing. Um, lastly, we have the community support team, and this, um, this team embodies the, um, the community services branch, which provides supportive services still for people um, in isolation or quarantine. And this is also the, the public information group uh, to complement our communications team and provide everything COVID-19 um, that the public wants to know about. So information about vaccines, um, they will refer to treatment, information about isolation and quarantine, prevention measures, uh, where to get tested. All of that information folks should be able to get from one single um, line operating, operated by uh, live staff. And that should be rolling out um, in one week. Uh, next slide. So um, I'll go briefly through the through the new case interview. This is uh, this is really exciting. Everyone is really motivated um, for this new case interview. So we've we've shifted away from um, collecting surveillance data and um, and mandating um, isolation and quarantine to a more client centered model uh, and providing resources and helping people with um, with what they need. So our, our first question when, when we call folks uh, for um, when they're reported to us with COVID is, is what do you need from us? What, what can we do to help you? And so, um, so we're no longer collecting uh, information about symptoms and who were you around when you got sick? And when was the last day you worked when you were infectious? Those things are still coming up, but they're not our priority. Our priority is the client. Um, to get better and um, make sure they know about the resources that are available to them, like treatment. So um, just today, we started um, asking uh, three questions of clients that we have never asked before, and we'll be collecting this information and using this to help drive our interviews um, through the remainder of the year. And the first one is, uh, what is your greatest concern related to COVID-19? How can the health department be most helpful and how do you like to receive information from the health department? And so we hope to find um, information about our community and also our priority populations by stratifying this information based on race and age and looking at the differences so we can target our interventions um, more effectively with those communities. 
Um, and then uh, right now we're still interviewing all cases. We are getting about four, a little over 400 cases per day over the past week. Um, and we will soon run out of capacity for that. And when that happens, we will be moving to the prioritized model, which is um, interviewing cases over 50 um, and cases at priority um, locations with congregate living, like jails, residential care, shelters, and also um, child care aged children. And with our health equity team and through um, collaborating with partners partnerships and strategies, we'll also be um, reaching out to people disproportionately affected by COVID based on socioeconomic status and demographic differences. Um, we're looking at these cases mapped in the equity areas and then providing the information um, in a different and innovative way um, to hopefully um, have a greater impact in reaching um, these communities. And that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you very much. I, I wanted to invite Jen to do that in part because I, I feel like that um, one of the ways that we internally have been uh, taking this transition to endemic most seriously is looking at how we do business. It's been such a slog. It's easy not to be reflective and try to improve it. And I think our team has, has done a fantastic job of thinking through our current priorities. I'm particularly excited about how we're reemphasizing or rather newly emphasizing access to treatment. And I think that's gonna be one of the most promising uh, new parts of the whole issue of contacting people. So thank you, Jen. And I'll echo Jen's uh, uh, offer to take questions for either her or me at this point. Jan, let me get my face back up there. Hold on. <laughs> um, there. First of all, thanks to Jen and her team. Um, that's amazing that you were able to restructure that, what seems like pretty quickly in, in light of all that everybody else is doing with what's going on at Tri-County and, and the reorganization is amazing. So thank you for that. Dr. Douglas, I have just a question on, um, I've been hearing that they've, they've been noticing some rebound on um, Paxlovid. And I was wondering if you had any had heard any of that or what your thoughts were on that. You know, it's funny you asked that, Jan. I had not heard that, although I'm, I'm on the Governor's Expert Emergency Epidemic Response Committee, and we had a meeting today, and that question came up for Donna Herrera, who's sort of, she's not a doc, but she supervises treatment distribution across Colorado, and she said there have been some sporadic reports of that, but she wasn't aware of any large quantitative impact. Um, one of the ID docs opined that there was... Um, it was not being widely reported in the ID literature either, although there had been some uh, uh, early comments about it. And at least at this point, there was not a recommendation that a person's undergo another round of treatment. Um, so I think it's an emerging uh, area that, again, has been noted at the anecdotal level, but I don't know of anything more quantitative than that to uh, offer. Okay, Dr. Faywell. Yeah, um, just a comment. It was it's encouraging to see that public health is looking at the at the admissions uh, with regard to COVID, whether it's from COVID or with COVID. Uh, though it may take years of record research, uh, it'll be interesting to see if that same approach is applied to COVID deaths, was it from COVID? Was it with COVID? You know, some, some mountain climber that falls off Mount Everest is dead. He's got COVID. Is that from COVID or with COVID? It's gonna take years to come up with that answer though. Well, I, I'm sure we'll improve things, uh, Tom, in that regard over time. Although I will say that really, since the beginning, and I, as far as I know, maybe Adam could come in. I still think this is being done. For cases to be finally determined as being uh, deaths due to COVID, um, they're reviewed by the National Center for Health Statistics. So we get provisional COVID death data, uh, but the ones that are finally being logged in have been reviewed by NCHS. They review all deaths, although they usually do so by an algorithm. Um, 
And I actually I shouldn't say that they've been able to keep up with COVID, at least for the first three or four months of the pandemic, they were. Uh, Adam, do you happen to know? You're not a vital records guy, but you're a data guy. Yeah, I, I was sorry. I've, I've been out of the, the weeds of this, too, since I've moved positions a little bit. But I have had conversations um, with Kirk Bull, who's the um, vital records manager over at CDPHG. And for 2020 data, uh, they have flushed that out because, uh, I mean, we do that they, they do that with um, all other forms of death as well, including whether you crash your car from a fentanyl overdose. And uh, uh, was it from fentanyl or is it from crashing into a telephone pole? Um, but, um, and so we do have, we do have a, a, a more of a distinction between whether or not those deaths are um, um, due to COVID or um, just incidental. Uh, but I'll get you more information about that. Um, I can follow up with you on that. Sorry. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, but overall, I think your point's really well taken, uh, Tom, that we the refinement of these, particularly these serious outcomes, will be a work in progress over time. Thank you. Uh, Julie Schultz. Um, thank you for the information. It's really great to hear about the, you know, how we're shifting to different work. Um, I was just thinking, you know, um, about our communities and how, you know, lifting of the mask mandates and how some of our community members maybe not actually thinking about the value of getting testing and knowing if they have COVID just from the perspective of um, having access to treatment. So, um, you know, really thinking about the opportunity to have new communication strategies in the community and helping, the, helping everyone understand um, there's still there's still value um, just from the perspective of knowing that treatment strategies are available for you. Um, and I think, you know, there's still may, there may be this perception of things are open, you don't need to quarantine, uh, testing isn't available, I don't need to think about treatment. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, there's just, uh, you know, the work, what you described, Jennifer, is such great work. I, I'm just thinking, really, we have such a nice opportunity just to make sure through communication that um, our communities know that um, there's still resources available and treatment available. Um, and, and while um, some of the previous structures that we had during COVID aren't there anymore, um, there, they, there still are some resources available that people can take um, advantage of. Um, because I, I'm uh, still, there, I lots. There's still people now who have said, "I, you know, I made it. I made it through the two years. I didn't get too. I didn't get COVID, and and now I've gotten it." Um, and those types of stories are starting to surface. So, just a comment, and thanks everybody for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I have a question about what the word uh, completed vaccination might mean since some people are getting a second booster. Um, and so is the completed uh, vaccination now um, the two shots plus one booster? And then my other question is whether when you when we talk about the variants, the new variants being um, well, the, the vaccine protecting against the new variants, is that, does that presuppose completed vaccination? And just, I mean, are, again, do we need to have this messaging about people still need to keep getting the boosters? Well, let me start with the easiest one. And that's, yes, we still need to have the messaging about people getting the boosters. 
Um, and I and I I just sent Becky an email this morning. I think our messaging, having looked at that modeling data, ought to be: if you're eligible and you've been thinking about it, quit thinking about it. Please act because now is the time to try to get that. Um, the the taxonomy of vaccination is getting more and more complicated as we have now. For some people, up to four doses recommended. Completed is still referring to completing the initial series, one J and J or or two. Pfizer, uh, Moderna. Um, eligible for a booster means that you've been more than four months since you got that. And, and because everybody 12 and up is eligible, you can be eligible. We haven't yet figured out if there is a way we can determine eligibility for a second booster because it's a more complicated uh, terminology. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll let Adam comment because I, I know his team's been sort of thinking about, is there any way we can meaningfully address this? I think, I think being able to ascertain that will get more and more complicated over time. Regarding the variant protection business, I didn't, the, the data the modeling team has been pulling together shows us pretty clearly that time since last vaccination is one of the most important parameters in terms of whether you get protected or not. And that would be time since last vaccine, whether it was a booster vaccine or whether it was your initial series. Um, and I think that's likely to turn out to be the case for the new variants as they come along. If you've got a first and second dose in early 2021 and you haven't bothered with a booster since then, you're uh, almost certainly, regardless of which variant comes along, are going to be at greater risk. Adam, any comments about how we're trying to unravel the tracking part of it, realizing that we um, are doing this as we transition to new health departments? Uh, and you guys are trying to triage your work. Sorry, are you just referring to what we track as boosters? Or is that the question? Yeah, and the, and the challenge of how do we track any booster, first booster, second booster, this kind of thing. Yeah, so we, we've begun to simplify that quite a bit. Um, part of it also has to do with how CDPHE tracks boosters, because uh, that's um, they've started doing some something that was different than what we were doing and so when the data get reported to us it, it starts to get confusing but we uh we just track one or more doses past uh, a completed series um, and so we're not tracking necessarily at this point the number of boosters afterwards or just if we're just counting you as boosted if you had um um sorry alex is okay um and that's how we're reporting it on our dashboards, so let me just do it. Alex, did you have an addition to that? Sorry. Oh, I, d I just wanted to make sure people know the difference between up to date and completed. Um, I just think that's that's a confusing one with the second booster right now, because up to date for most people means you've completed your primary series. So that first Johnson and Johnson or the first and second of an mRNA and you've had your booster dose. Right now, that second booster is not considered up to date. Like it's not in the up to date definition. It's just like an optional add on. We don't know if that'll change at some point in time. So that's what also makes it confusing. There's a lot of different terms. And children who aren't eligible for boosters are up to date when they just have their primary series. So just to clearly make it more confusing. <laughs> um, so those are just some of the things we're dealing with in these definitions. And, and we kind of attribute that um, similarly to when people get their childhood vaccination series. And then once you complete the series, you're up to date. And so that's really where CDC grabbed onto that verbiage. Again, to be consistent across different vaccinations. Similarly, that's, that's how they um, moved into using that up to date verbiage. Great. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, Let's move on to the executive director's report. I, you know, I continue to just be so impressed with the Tri-County team for your continued commitment to really important public health challenges. And great to see, by the way, that the dollars from the opioid settlement are will become available in the third quarter. Great news. So Dr. Douglas, anything else you'd like to highlight? You know, I just want to congratulate Greta Maxey again uh, for being uh, highlighted with the work she's been doing. Uh, with the Behavioral Health Recovery Act and uh, the uh, Afghan community. I think that's just 
fantastically critical work. We tend to forget about it when we're talking about fentanyl and COVID, but it's uh, just part of the many things that public health takes seriously. Um, I, I'll, I'll point out that we're you know, continuing to be incredibly diligent about whatever we can do to enhance retention of our staff. Maybe it's a good chance to say one staff we didn't retain, and we're saying goodbye to her today. Monique, you can look up now so we can wish you a fond farewell. This is Monique's last day with us, and she's moving on to help economic development in Denver, which, because I live in Denver, will be a great thing, but we will certainly miss her. Um, and as Mame has outlined, we will be soon offering the end of June retention bonus as well as finalizing plans for the end of December bonus. Um, and then I guess the final thing I'd call out is it's getting hot out there, if you didn't notice. And hotness means ozone. Appreciate Brian outlining some of the uh, recommendations of an internal work group we had about ozone reduction. This is not something that any group of public health department employees is going to do for such a massive problem. But I think it's uh, sort of as we get into severe non-attainment, an increasing issue that all of us are going to have to pay more attention to. Great. Thank you. Um, not seeing any more hands up. Uh, we'll move on to other items in terms of setting the agenda for the June board meeting. The Board of Health is scheduled to review the quarterly financial report as well as the final auditor's report. So thank you, Monique, for that seamless transition so that we'll be in good shape to have that information at our next meeting. Um, in addition, we'll have our regularly scheduled uh, COVID update. And um, as always, please let Julie Malika or myself know if there are any other additional topics um, Board of Health would like us to cover during our meeting. Um, any board member remarks? Jan? Hi, um, I would just, it is National Nurses Week, and I would like to honor all the nurses at Tri-County in public health in general, and all the nurses on the front line for staying the course and hanging in there. And I just want to say that I am really proud to stand with them. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, as always, I wanted to thank my fellow Board of Health members who volunteer their time in the service of keeping the citizens of our region healthy and safe. And a special thanks to the Tri-County team as always um, to assure that vital public health services continue to be available in Adams and Arapahoe counties. Um, as a final topic, uh, Board of Health um, oh, will be moving into executive session to meet with legal counsel in accordance with the Colorado Open Meetings Law CID. Um, did you want to provide the provision that it provides for client attorney consultation with the Board of Health, please? Um, I said you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, Madam Chair, we yeah. are uh, requesting that we move into executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute Section 24-6-402, parentheses four, close of parentheses. The matters to be discussed today are matters such as uh, dissolution and winding up relating to Tri-County Health Department, and also uh, perhaps to talk about related issues. Um, so we're requesting that the, uh, the uh, meeting not be recorded. Uh, <clears throat> in addition, we have a a portion of the executive session is a personnel matter to discuss the executive director's uh, midterm performance. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to move into executive session with our legal counsel? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Ron A, can you move us into executive session, please? Absolutely. Just give me a second. We'll get everybody out. It looks like we do not have anybody public attending, so that makes it easy. Um, rest of our staff have left. I will go ahead and lock the meeting and stop the live stream. Great, thank you.
Thank you. Um, we have uh, five topics to cover 